at a time when NATO needs to ramp up defence production to help Ukraine and to replenish its own stocks, so, you know, suddenly having a Swedish defence industry in the mix is uh, very, very helpful. Both force is also a, a, a major Swedish uh, arms manufacturer. Um, the second thing is that the, the Swedes have a number of uh, modern uh, armed uh, uh, brigades with heavy equipment at a time when many NATO countries after the Cold War got rid of tanks and, uh, and artillery and armoured personnel carriers because they didn't think they needed them anymore. The Swedes, like the Finns, Hang, you know, hang, hung on to theirs. Uh, and now they're, they're needed, of course, which helps. And, and you rightly mentioned the Swedish Navy uh, and particularly the anti-submarine warfare capability. You know, the, the Swedes for many years, even while they were neutral, had problems with Soviet submarines sneaking into their territorial waters. There was a major incident in 1981 called Whiskey on the Rocks when a Russian Soviet whiskey class submarine actually ran aground uh, in Sweden. So uh, the Swedes therefore do bring that maritime capability uh, into NATO. Hello and welcome to Frontline. I'm Alex Dibble, Times Radio's Deputy Head of News. And today on Frontline, we are joined by a former Deputy Assistant Secretary General of NATO with 38 years experience as a member of the Alliance's international staff. Dr. Jamie Shea has been a spokesperson for three Secretary Generals and is now a Professor of Strategy and Security at the University of Exeter. Dr. Jamie Shea, welcome. Thank you very much, Alex. Great to be with you. Wanted to start by talking about Sweden's accession to NATO. We're talking about a week uh, since that happened. In your opinion, how significant is that? Well, first of all, I think, Alex, it's a big relief for NATO uh, because uh, the Swedes were expecting to be in NATO already last year uh, when their neighbours, Finland, uh, joined. Uh, you remember they made a kind of joint application uh, soon after Russia uh, invaded Ukraine back in 2022. They've always sort of been security partners, so they expected it would be a package for NATO. You can't have one without the other. And yet, uh, unfortunately, the Swedes were uh, uh, singled out by, by Turkey and Hungary in particular because of different bilateral issues. Uh, and those two countries went ahead with the Finnish ratification, but held up the Swedish ratification, which only happened, as you rightly said, just a couple of days ago when the Hungarian parliament finally uh, passed uh, the, uh, the, the measure uh, ratifying Sweden's uh, membership. So for NATO, of course, you know, to go to the Washington summit this July, when NATO is celebrating its 75th anniversary with great fanfare, with the Swedish issue unresolved, would have been a major embarrassment, uh, uh, frankly, and not a good display of NATO unity. Uh, you know, it, it's something that makes so much sense for the defence of the West, having Sweden as well as Finland in NATO at the present time, and yet allies, you know, bickering over bilateral issues and holding the whole thing up. So I think the dominant feeling is one of relief uh, that it's finally over and NATO can go back to being a completely uh, unified and united uh, alliance. But apart from that, of course, uh, it has uh, quite a good Im big implications for NATO's ability to defend Northern Europe. And at the time today, as we speak, NATO has just launched a big exercise uh, uh, in, uh, called Nordic Response in the region, testing for the first time its capacity uh, not just to, only to have Sweden as a member, but to actually defend Sweden and Norway against a hypothetical uh, Russian attack. So if you like, Sweden joins on Monday and on Tuesday, there's already a big, big NATO presence on the territory uh, uh, showing, uh, uh, demonstrating NATO's ability to, you know, to fold Sweden into its defence plans. I've made a note to, to come back to you and talk in more detail about the exercises that are going on you know, right now. Um, but before we do that, in terms of that area of Europe, what exact ways do you think it bolsters NATO's capabilities in defence, having Sweden now as a member, in particular with regard to um, potentially sea defences and, and submarines and things like this? What, what does Sweden bring to the table? Well, first of all, you're right. I mean, Sweden was a country that during its long uh, decades of neutrality 
uh, after 1834, when it first declared neutrality and decided to stay out of Europe's sort of quarrels, uh, it's taken defence seriously. Uh, uh, being alone, it decided it needed to rely upon its own efforts. So the Swedes build up quite a, a modern defence industry. You've heard of Saab, of course, uh, which makes cars, but also makes uh, 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 aircraft and, and makes all kinds of defence equipment. Uh, it's also quite uh, uh, well developed in the cyber defence, electronic sort of spectrum as well. Uh, at a time when NATO needs to ramp up defence production to help Ukraine and to replenish its own stocks, so, you know, suddenly having a Swedish defence industry in the mix is uh, very, very helpful. Bofors is also a, a, a major Swedish uh, arms manufacturer. Um, the second thing is that the, the Swedes have a number of uh, modern uh, armed uh, uh, brigades with heavy equipment at a time when many NATO countries after the Cold War got rid of tanks and, uh, and artillery and armoured personnel carriers because they didn't think they needed them anymore. The Swedes, like the Finns, hang, you know, hang, hung on to theirs. Uh, and now they're, they're needed, of course, which helps. And, and you rightly mentioned the Swedish Navy uh, and particularly the anti-submarine warfare capability. You know, the, the Swedes, for many years, even while they were neutral, had problems with Soviet submarines sneaking into their territorial waters. There was a major incident in 1981 called Whiskey on the Rocks when a Russian Soviet whiskey class submarine actually ran aground uh, in Sweden. So uh, the Swedes, therefore, do bring that maritime capability uh, into NATO. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Sweden and Finland in NATO give NATO much greater access to the Baltic Sea, much greater control of the Baltic Sea, and the ability to bottle up the Russian Navy uh, in St. Petersburg. But of course, it comes also, like anything, with a price. Uh, Finland uh, has a 1,300 kilometer border with Russia, which overnight doubles the amount of border with Russia that NATO has to defend. That's why the this exercise, which I referred to, is, is taking place. So yes, you get a lot more capabilities. You, uh, you know, some of the more recent NATO enlargements, uh, Alex. You know, you think of North Macedonia, you think of Montenegro, have been politically valuable, but haven't really brought much additional capability uh, into the alliance. With Finland and Sweden, for the first time in a long time, you get two newcomers, but who are sort of you know modern well-equipped, you know, high-tech uh, countries, uh, which will bring those capabilities in at a time when NATO, frankly, uh, uh, badly needs them. So let's talk in a bit more detail then about this exercise. Every now and again, we get NATO exercises. We know that they are very, very important for how the alliance sets itself up strategically, defensively, and, and also demonstrates to people like Vladimir Putin and others, um, that the alliance is, is ready uh, at any given moment. What do you know about this one and, um, and how significant is this as Sweden has now joined? Well, this this exercise that's, that's going on at the moment uh, for, for uh, the, the, the Nordic countries uh, is part of a much larger NATO exercise, which kicked off already uh, at the beginning of uh, February, um, which is called Steadfast Defender. And it will involve uh, 90,000 troops being deployed. You may have seen that Grant Shapps at the very beginning also said that the UK would deploy uh, with rotation up to 40,000 troops uh, over the next few months. Uh, so is playing a big role. The, the idea is, is to test NATO's ability to implement its regional defence plans. Uh, at the NATO summit in, in, in Vilnius uh, last July, the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, who's always a, a four-star American general admiral, uh, called Chris Cavoli. He came up with the so-called regional defence plans. In other words, the first war fighting plans for the whole of NATO territory that NATO has come up with uh, since the uh, end of the Cold War. But now the, the, these exercises are testing just how ready NATO is to really implement them. And of course, it's going to come up with a number of lessons when it comes to gaps. You know, not enough transport ships, uh, you know, not enough satellite bandwidth, difficulty with uh, mobility and logistics, moving troops over a high, uh, large area, for example. The troops get there, but the equipment takes more time to arrive. So there'll be lots and lots of lessons which the NATO summit in Washington in July will draw. And of course, now Finland and Sweden are both in NATO. This exercise has been sort of 
extended up in their region to test the ability uh, for NATO to defend the uh, the high north as, as well uh, and to have you know UK uh, German forces Norwegian forces Danish forces having been in NATO for a long time to seamlessly interact with their Swedish and Finnish counterparts as part of a, a collective uh, a, a, a defense so that's what it's uh, basically all about um, and, and again as, as I've said it will sort of be a sort of reality check for NATO you know NATO has been back in the business of collective defense since Russia uh, invaded uh, uh, Ukraine for the first time in 2014 and annexed Crimea. But hitherto for, the plans have been largely focused on the Baltics because that was always seen as the vulnerable area. And the UK is leading the NATO multinational battalion currently in Estonia. But now NATO is saying, aha, but you know, we, we could have a p- potential confrontation with Russia in other parts of Europe, on the Black Sea, in the Western Balkans, uh, in the High North. So, you know, how good are we at defending these other regions that are not, if you like, the central front with Poland and the Baltic states? I wonder if I could ask you, you know, most people, when they assess from their perspective potential conflict or NATO's ability to defend itself, um, do so from an armchair without having been on the battlefield. One of the elements of um, Sweden and Finland is that they are they are Baltic, and therefore that means, in very basic terms, it's quite a lot colder around where they are than most people seem to realise. Um, what difference does temperature make to conflict? Well, uh, you're right. And I think one of the reasons for having this exercise in March, early March, is although spring is arriving slowly in the UK and here in Belgium, of course, it's still winter uh, up there. So you can still do a lot of winter training. And uh, for example, the Royal Marines, uh, UK forces, American forces have been doing winter training uh, uh, up in Norway in, in recent years, when there was a sense that all of this after, you know, which went quiet after the end of the Cold War, had to be sort of revived. Uh, And of course, uh, Finland in particular has got excellent winter capabilities. Um, Everybody who who studies history remember remember the Winter War of 1940 when uh, Finns on skis and wearing white uh, 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 uniforms so that they sort of melded into the the landscape, inflicted a number of uh, humiliations on the Soviet forces, although they had to give in eventually. So I think, you know, in terms of interacting with countries like Finland and Sweden, which are used to winter warfare uh, and could do it at scale, will provide, uh, you know, many uh, useful lessons in terms of mobility, survivability, you know, which equipment works in those kind of temperatures uh, and doesn't work uh, uh, very well. Um, and uh, so uh, that's the idea, as I mentioned, of doing it now in March before winter fades away and you can't sort of get that sort of training in. On the other hand, the exercise is 50% land of 50% air and maritime. So uh, the uh, effort is to sort of test the capacity of the navies and the air forces and not just the capacity of the capacities of the armies. We've heard over the last week or two, lots of people throw their tuppence worth, um, if I'm mixing metaphors, I probably am, into the ring um, with regard to the trident uh, failures. Um What's your personal uh, assessment of whether that is or is not something that the UK and indeed NATO more generally should be concerned about? Well, uh, Samuel Beckett once said, fail, fail again and fail better next time. Uh, By what he meant that, you know, you you learn from your failures more than you learn from your successes. So providing that, you know, you learn the lessons quickly and you can... you can fix the glitch with the technology uh, and bounce back quickly. Uh, they're not necessarily bad things. And, and Gar- uh, Grant Chaps, the U.S. defense, uh, UK, excuse me, defense secretary, was at pains to point out, of course, afterwards that uh, it, it had been a, a failure linked to a test rather than a real live firing. When apparently, had it been a live firing, this glitch, which was linked to a test, would not have happened. I mean, of course, it's embarrassing, uh, you know, uh, for, for the Navy, uh, for the UK government, and nobody likes to see a, a, a failure but you're, you're dealing with obviously highly sort of you know sophisticated technologies uh, the reason for testing them in the first place is to make sure that they can work and operate uh, if you have a whole series of failures 
uh, of a certain system. Uh, the Russians, for example, have had this with one of their missiles called the Balava in recent years. Then you can start asking questions about whether the whole thing was properly designed or properly uh, manufactured. But if you just have you know one isolated failure, which can fix quickly, be fixed quickly, I, I wouldn't sort of pay too much attention to it. The UK clearly is a country which is dedicated to maintaining its at sea nuclear deterrent. It's going to modernise it, so it's not going to be held back by one uh, single system. And failure, particularly if they can quickly identify the cause uh, and link it to a test rather than a, 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 a something that would have been a, a potentially a, you know, disastrous failure uh, in a live operation. Another big story this week has been the the interception of a call between the head of the German Luftwaffe and some of his colleagues by Russian officials, um, all about uh, plans for missiles and potential targets that they were going to look at. And now Russia has uh, this conversation and uh, and can act in, in light of it. One of the other things that it revealed, allegedly, was uh, that British forces in some capacity are on Ukrainian soil and potentially other NATO forces as well. You mentioned Sweden and that border with Russia. How significant do you think it is that Russia now has apparent confirmation through this call that there are NATO boots on the ground in Ukraine? Well, the, the starting point, Alex, is to say that, uh, you know, I'm not an official any longer, so I have no confidential information to share with you, which I wouldn't have been able to share with you anyway, had I still been inside, if you like, NATO headquarters uh, as to, you know, who has what in Ukraine. Um, and of course, you know, uh, it, there's a, a kind of sort of standing practice among NATO countries that you don't reveal uh, the sort of confidential operations of other NATO countries' forces, uh, uh, right? But having said that, uh, we, we know from the, our experience in the Balkans, in Afghanistan, in, in Libya, uh, particularly when the histories are written, that the countries do put special forces uh, into these situations. Uh, they do it to gather intelligence, they do it for training purposes, they do it to help with targeting operations and, 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 and the like, uh, you know, particularly if they're giving highly sophisticated weapons, uh, which has been the case with you know, the UK and many other countries, uh, to the Ukrainians. So I don't suppose if you're in the security business, it would strike you as a massive revelation or a surprise to discover that this, th these things are taking place. The UK also has a long, long, long tradition, which goes way back before the time of Boris Johnson and, and the, uh, the, uh, the British assistance to Ukraine, you know, the first to give tanks, the first to give quite a number of, you know, air defence systems at the beginning of the conflict. The, you know, the UK has a long tradition of training and equipping the Ukrainians. So, for example, NATO had a programme of, of capacity building uh, located at the Yavoriv training ground in western Ukraine. This is is not confidential information. It was public knowledge as part of, you know, the, the bilateral NATO-Ukraine uh, assistance program, uh, where you know the UK forces, the the Canadians and others were, were actively involved. So, uh, so yes, it, it's not exactly helpful when this sort of leak uh, 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 occurs, but I don't suppose, you know, it would take, as I say, anybody by surprise. But it is, again, a, a demonstration that the Russians are highly skilled uh, in electronic intercepts, communication intercepts. It's not the first incident of this kind uh, uh, which can be linked. It's, it's part of what NATO would call hybrid warfare tactics to try to, you know, discredit uh, politicians, to sow discord, uh, uh, among populations to to embarrass us, and it does show the need to look at operational uh, procedures. Uh, you know, because if there is a, a leak, it. it, it success that there's been an intercept. It suggests that security has not been what it should be for these kind of communications. Uh, uh, you know, the Germans have already said they're going to investigate and, and, and obviously, hopefully, improve their procedures uh, in, in future. I, I think it's embarrassing rather than damaging uh, in, the, in the long run. Um, you know, the real debate is not so much whether countries have got small groups of special forces operating. The, the real debate has been, you know, obviously unleashed by President Macron of France uh, in, in sort of suggesting that maybe you know the West should send combat forces to Ukraine, uh, which of course is something on a much different dimension to for small groups of special forces, and where you need a real policy debate whether this is uh, the, the right thing to do or not. Well, why don't we talk about those words from President Macron? When you heard them, 
Was it a an eyebrow raised in the O'Shea household, or was it a head in hands moment? No, I, I you know President Macron likes to provoke a debate. Uh, he, he's well known for doing that. He called NATO brain dead back in 2019, and I'm not sure he actually meant it, but he provoked a debate at the time about whether NATO was doing enough, for example, to consult politically on issues rather than simply organise military activities. I think basically what he wants to do this time, you know, is basically sort of point out to his European counterparts at a time when Ukraine is running out of ammunition, American aid in Congress, as we know has been blocked and Ukrainians are starting to you know be driven back by Russian forces you know they they had to uh, withdraw from Madvika a couple of weeks back they've had to surrender more territory since not not significant so far but but it's it's not a good sign I think what President Macron was trying to say look you know uh, all options have to be on the table and if we don't you know step up our support to Ukraine uh, and Ukraine really suffers more setbacks then you know maybe we're going to have to look at doing this in the future, as unpalatable it, 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 it is. So in a way, I think he was using this as a sort of a mechanism to say, look, <laughs> uh, you know, if you want the Ukrainians to do the fighting themselves, which is the Western strategy, we don't commit ground troops, we don't want an escalation with Russia, then the best thing to do is arm the Ukrainians um, and to make that point. Because, you know, the French recently uh, have been very much in the forefront of saying that if the US aid is blocked and, and could continue to be blocked, for some time, particularly getting into an election cycle. There's no indication, Alex, that the House of Representatives is, is going to pass a, a new sort of military aid package anytime soon. Uh, Europe has to step in uh, and, and let's have a debate about precisely how we, we do that. So I, I see Macron's, you know, Macron once quoted Gerard de Gaulle as saying, I kick the apple cart and I see what falls out. In other words, I provoke a debate. And I think that's what this is intended to do. That's my take on it anyway. Uh, from one politician to another, uh, we're speaking after the U.S. Supreme Court has cleared Donald Trump's path uh, to be on the ballot when uh, Americans choose their next president. Um, Donald Trump's view on NATO and the comments he's made about it have been many and controversial. Just wanted to get your take on if we are to have a second term of Donald Trump, by the end of that term, how do you see global security? Well, you know, it, it obviously creates uncertainty and anxiety. Uh, you know, President Trump uh, uh, didn't pull out of NATO last time he was in the White House. Uh, he uh, indeed sent you know, American ships and American uh, strategic bombers to Europe on NATO exercises. He increased by four times. It's true. The amount of uh, spending on American military infrastructure uh, in, in Europe. Uh, Trump would say, look, you know, I used uh, shock therapy with the Europeans and they didn't particularly like it, but I got them to do what previous presidents had not been able to do, to spend more money on defense. Under my watch, you know, uh, you know, the, the number of NATO countries meeting that 2% of GDP target for defence went up. Uh, and that's a good thing because that's not what I asked them to do. That's what NATO itself back in 2014 at the Wales Summit with David Cameron in the chair uh, at the time, you know, uh, uh, agreed to, 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 to do. So, you know, if, if what we're seeing from President Trump, if he does return to the White House, if it's a repeat of what we saw before, it will be uncomfortable, but not potentially catastrophic. The pressure will be used to persuade European countries to increase their defence budgets. Uh, and indeed, many of them are doing so already. Uh, the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, announced a couple of weeks ago that this year he expects 18 of the 32 allies to meet the 2% target. Now, that's not totally satisfactory. It's not all 32, but the trend line is up. Uh, the the Europeans have spent in the last couple of years about 350 billion euros extra on previous plans on defense. So even where they're not at 2%, they're at least heading in the right di di direction. But of course, there's another, Alex, there's another scenario which is more worrying that, you know, if Trump does come back, this time round, he's not fettered any longer 
by uh, generals uh, in the National Security Council telling him, no, Mr. President, you can't do that. Or he's not fettered by senior re internationalist Republicans like, you know, Mitch McConnell, who is now leaving. Uh, he's announced he's retiring. You know, these kind of people who were there before saying, sorry, Mr. President, but the Republican Party of which, to which you belong is not going to allow you to do that because we believe in NATO. So in, in a sense, we'll have to see who goes into the White House with Trump. You know, we used to speak about the adults in the room that would sort of, you know, stop you know, the bad things from happening, uh, 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 who restrained the president. Uh, and we have to see, you know, what the shape of Congress looks like. You know, if, for example, the Democrats uh, controlled the Senate or the House uh even if Trump controls the White House, you would obviously have, you know, a pushback. Uh, the Senate last year, Alex, did, uh, with Republicans uh, voting as well, passed a law overwhelmingly to prohibit the uh, president from withdrawing from a NATO treaty without the consent of the Senate because you needed two thirds of the Senate to approve the treaty in the first place. So, so, you know, there are, you know, America is still a country with checks and balances and we'll have to wait and see, you know, if Trump is serious about pulling out of NATO or whether he's just using it as a device to scare people to get the Europeans to invest more in their own defense. So, you know, if you want to make uh, NATO less vulnerable to criticism from Donald Trump, the best thing the Europeans can do is to get up to that 2% uh, benchmark in the way that the UK, Poland, uh, you know, Germany now this year, so many other countries are deciding to uh, uh, to do. It, it doesn't give you a guarantee that Trump won't do the worst, but at least it sort of helps to present NATO in a more positive light uh, to Trump and his supporters in the United States. Dr. Jamie Shea, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Frontline. It's been fascinating as always to get your thoughts. So uh, we very much appreciate it. Thank you. Alex, uh, as always, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for taking the time to watch today's episode of Frontline from Times Radio, our podcast dedicated to defence and security. Uh, for more, do listen to the Times World in 10 podcast, where we look at not just defence and security, but all global matters, the important ones that you need to know. Uh, that is the Times World in 10 podcast. For now, though, uh, thank you again for your time and uh, we'll see you soon on Frontline. Do remember to subscribe uh, for more from Frontline and from Times Radio.